Mark has given us a, a preview of where we're headed in our story today with King Solomon. Um, he is an interesting figure and that we will touch on again even next week. But it is our pleasure today uh, to have our message brought by a new friend of mine. Uh, David Clark is a retired professor from Bethel University, Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. A uh, friend of Rod Casey, and we're friends. And <clears throat> oh, several months ago, uh, Rod um, suggested that maybe Dr. Clark could come and speak here. He's in town for a seminar yesterday, and um, I was open to that. Uh, I was a little hesitant uh, for a, a seminary professor coming and speaking well over my head, and maybe even over your head. Uh, but Rod said, oh, don't worry about that. You'll love him. Uh, it'll be wonderful. And so because I trust Rod, and now I know for sure because the 8 o'clock service was wonderful. Um, I, I'm excited that uh, David is going to speak. So David, if you'll join me, and um, he's going to tell us a, just a tiny bit about himself and then get into the story of Solomon with an illustration and several things like that. Sounds and, great. Yeah, I'm excited. So yeah. you, uh, you made it the first time, so... <laughs> Do it again. Welcome, uh, David Clark. So, <clears throat> um, well, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to be here, and uh, we're done. No, uh, I was <clears throat> invited back to this for the second time, and I found out I was one of the few people uh, that was invited back the second time, and it was kind of disappointing to learn that everyone else seemed to get it done in one shot, and I needed two shots to get it done. So, anyway, it's great to be back. I was uh, born and reared in Tokyo. I know that's, you could probably look at me and tell that right away. Um, and uh, my mom and dad were missionaries. Dad is 100. He is a World War II vet. And um, he wears his World War II veteran hat to Walmart and uh, attracts a lot of attention. You know, people want his, his signature and take pictures with him and stuff like that. While I stand off to the side and wait for all the all the adoring fans to finish up. And mom is 99, they're, they're wonderful living in, in St. Paul. I say to my, to my two sons, you know, don't expect an inheritance anytime soon. So hopefully that'll work out for me. And um, growing up in Japan, I learned an awful lot about, uh, about the Word of God. And uh, it turns out that uh, as I've studied over the years, I've learned that what God has told us in his word is reliable, that it fits the best of what we know from all kinds of human research and human knowledge and human understanding. And so what I want to share this morning is a little bit about how we can take what God has provided through this guy named Solomon and uh, actually make this work in our own lives. So to get us started, I'd like to tell about a time 20 years or so ago when I went to this professional conference at a beautiful old hotel, it's beautiful, lots of charm. But the problem with an old hotel is that while it had lots of charm, some of the things didn't work. So <clears throat> one evening after the final meeting of the day, hundreds of people were flowing out of the ballroom and everybody was headed toward the elevators and we got to the elevator, the elevators were packed. And I got to the elevator, there's just like this much room, and I squeezed into the front. It was so tight that I had this leather case that was kind of jammed up against me. I couldn't even put my arms down because that's how jammed it was in there. So we're jammed in this elevator, and the elevator starts going up, and all of a sudden, gunk, 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 and the elevator gets stuck between floors. And I'm thinking, oh no, oh no. So I learned that day that I have a little claustrophobia. Is there anybody out there that has claustrophobia? Can I get an amen from anybody? Okay, okay. The first service was kind of, you know, they were sort of dead. I didn't see anybody that had claustrophobia in the first service, but I, I can see that I've got some fellow, fellow sufferers here. Uh, we're going to have a support group meeting right here at the front of the service after, after we're done. So anyway... I'm, I'm in this elevator, we're stuck, I didn't know how long we're going to be there, I'm jammed in tight, I can hardly move. All of a sudden, this old guy in the back of the, back of the elevator, oh no, we're stuck 
between floors. Ha, 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 ha. He thought it was hilarious. I'm panicking, you know, sweat's going down my face. It's dribbling down the center of my back. He says, I'm a World War II vet. And when I was in the war, the Nazis captured me and they put me in a refrigerator and locked the refrigerator for five days. I was locked in a refrigerator. <laughs> and I'm going, this is not helping at all. <laughs> and uh, then one of the other guys says, hey, you, ne- you need to be quiet. There might be somebody with, you know, mental problems here that uh, is claustrophobic and you're just going to cause them to panic and get more anxious. And I'm thinking, you know, that doesn't help either. 20 minutes later, thankfully, thankfully, I, you could see that I lived to tell the story, but the elevator started to move again, and, uh, and I was saved. Well, claustrophobia is one type of fear. And I learned that day that this being in tight spaces is just not my cup of tea. And uh, I can see that some of you relate to that, which is really great. Now, would you be surprised to learn that actually this concept of fear is something that all of us have at different places in our lives? All of us have our phobias, our fears, if you will. For example, there's a whole study in the leadership area that says if you're a leader, like you're a small group leader or you're a leader of a business or you're leading a classroom or whatever, that your fears actually have an impact on how you lead and how the the group will go. So it, it actually can play out in your relationships with others. For instance, if you're really afraid to confront somebody who's who's acting inappropriately, pretty soon the group will become toxic. Did you know that? Did you think about that? And part of leadership is to help people who are maybe acting a little inappropriately to, to, to act more like you should in a, in a group, in a community. And so it turns out that this idea of fear is really a, an important thing that has an impact on our lives. And I mention this because the ancient King Solomon has a lot to teach us about this concept. So Pastor Jed has been preaching for a couple of weeks on David. Even the kids knew that, so that was impressive. And uh, you are working through the Bible on this concept of the story. And Solomon is the one we're up to now because two weeks of David and his son is Solomon. And as the kids told you, Solomon was a king. He was Israel's third king. We don't know exactly how old Solomon was when he became king, but he was young. Some of the scholars think maybe 14 years old. Anybody 14? Or they're all with the kids now. But, you know, could imagine being 14 years old and suddenly being named king. That would be quite challenging. And 1 Kings chapter 3 tells us that when Solomon became king at this very young age, that God appeared to him in a dream. And God said to him, whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you. Now, that's pretty cool. What would you ask for if God said, I'll give you anything you want? I mean, you could ask for wealth. You know, you're a king. You could ask for a really powerful army. Uh, You could uh, ask for pleasure. Um, You could ask for a lot of different things. And Solomon, young, almost a child, wisely said, I'm young. I don't know how to lead this people. I'm not sure how to be king. I would like to receive the gift of wisdom. And God was pleased with that answer. And so he gave Solomon what he asked for. In fact, because Solomon was so wise in this request, he's come to be known as the wisest man who ever lived. Now that raises a question for us. What exactly is wisdom? When God gave wisdom to Solomon, what did Solomon get? What is it? Well, it's not exactly the same as knowledge. You know, you could have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and that's not exactly the same as wisdom, because wisdom is more than that. Wisdom is actually the ability to see all the experiences of our life, all the facts of life, all the details of life, in a wider perspective, in a bigger perspective. It is the ability to make a choice about my life and to live my life in in light of this wider perspective. Now, this, seri- this fact, this idea, by the way, I think, is why this series on the story is so important. Because what's happening is that you're learning the whole biblical story, the story of the Bible from beginning to end, and that is actually the largest story 
which makes sense out of our personal story. Does that make sense to you? That's the large frame or the large picture that makes sense out of our own personal experiences and stories. My first job interview for teaching, I've been a teacher for part of my life, was uh, a long time ago when I was uh, teaching part-time at a community college. And the community college had a full-time position open up, and I wanted that position bad. So I interviewed for the position. I interviewed to become a full-time teacher, and I did not get the job. And I was so disappointed. I said, God, what are you doing? I thought you called me to be a teacher. I was totally bummed out, but it was uh, just actually six months or so later that I was interviewed for another job at a four-year college, and then Sandy and I were invited to be part of that, and so we moved to the state of Georgia and lived there for about 10 years to teach there. Well, 15 years after that, I was back in Illinois, where the community college was located, visiting with some friends. Sandy and I were there with this friend and his uh, bride, and all of a sudden a person came up to us in the restaurant and said, Oh, I think I know who you are. You're, you're David and Sandy. And we said, yeah, we are. And all of a sudden I remembered, this is the guy who got the job. He was the one who interviewed, and he beat me out for that job. I was so bummed. And I said, oh, it's wonderful to see you. What are you doing? And he said, well, I'm still teaching at the community college. I really wanted to go teach at a four-year school, but I'm still here, and I'm stuck, and I can't get out. All of a sudden I realized, uh uh-oh, God had said no. I had been so bummed. But in the bigger picture, guess what? God had meant it for my good. (laughs) Does it take a lot of faith to believe that the God who knows everything about the universe and everything about you when he says no might be doing you a favor? We often get so bummed about that little detail that didn't go quite right. But maybe there's a bigger perspective. And that day, I learned a bigger perspective. I should have remembered. In fact, I was a little embarrassed that I forgot that God is at work doing what is good in our lives. And yet sometimes we get down in the weeds and we forget that. And instead of trusting God and living in wisdom, we live in fear. Anybody ever done that? Well, Solomon was a guy who was wise. And God had given him this wisdom of great perspective. And we are blessed because under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Solomon left behind his wisdom in a number of writings. It tells the story of Solomon in some chapters of 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But also, uh, Solomon left behind the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, which is instructions on love and sexuality. And I know I'm sorry this isn't the topic today. But uh, Pastor Jed is going to preach on that sometime down the road here, and uh, I'll let him deal with that whole subject. Also, there's the subject of Ecclesiastes. Now, this is kind of an interesting book. It's sort of, you know, teachings about the meaning of life, that kind of thing. And then, of course, there's the book of Proverbs, which is pithy sayings of wisdom. So there's a lot here, right? You could have a whole course on the writings of Solomon. But what we're going to do is to zero in on the most important thing that he said. Now, this has got to be good, right? Because you're talking about the most important thing written down by the wisest person who ever lived. Okay, so are you ready for that? What do you think it is? Well, the theme of the book of Proverbs is this, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. Now, let's talk about fear a little bit. I've already confessed before you my claustrophobia. When I get on an airplane, I am always really, really, really certain to sit on the aisle seat so that I can, you know, not feel claustrophobic and, and, and uh, feel like I'm hemmed in. And my lovely bride always, you know, takes the inside seat. There are lots of other fears, though. I actually looked this up on the internet. Phobialist.com lists 513 possible fears. Did you know that? Don't check your phones now. This is for after when we're done. done. 
but I'll give you a little foretaste of what you'll find. Like, for instance, there's something called octophobia, which is the fear of the number eight. Anybody got that problem? Okay, good. Healthy group here. There's something called Dutch phobia, fear of the Dutch. Any Dutch people here? I don't know, maybe not. Up in Iowa, there's some Dutch folks. Okay, I had to practice saying this word, conseco talophobia, the fear of chopsticks. <laughs> I threw that one in because of my background in Japan. You know, I grew up eating with chopsticks. Uh, there's uh, geniophobia, the fear of chins, and then the pantophobia is the, just the fear of everything. The fear of the Lord, though, is not like any of these fears. It's a very different kind of fear. We use the same word, but its meaning is very, very different. And here's why that's so. Because when we talk about the fear of the Lord, we're not talking about things that are spooky or things that cause us to be afraid or threaten us. We're talking about the kinds of things that we honor and respect. So the fear of the Lord is something like uh, love, honor, trust, and respect. This is actually a good kind of fear. So in Proverbs 1, verse 7, we get the whole book started off with this kind of theme statement, this thesis statement, you could say. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. This is the, the theme. This is a, not a loveless kind of dread that you have for like an abusive football coach, it is rather a kind of respectful love, hope, and trust. Not a slavish fear, but more like a family loyalty. That would be the fear of the Lord. Now, how do you develop this kind of fear? So I got a couple of thoughts. And one thing I'd like to suggest from the text is that it's important for us to open our minds and to open our hearts to wisdom. I've been a teacher for 45 years, and I can honestly say that one of the challenges to being a teacher is a student who doesn't want to learn. Anybody ever experienced that? Here's a person who needs to learn but just won't listen. I've noticed that uh, the students who need good advice the most are the ones who resist it the most. Have you ever noticed that? And those who need it the least often are the ones who are most anxious to receive it. But this is what Solomon says about people like that. Fools, fools, think that their way is right. The wise listen to others. You will flounder around in your life until you open your heart to the advice and guidance and wisdom of godly people. Unfortunately, that's just how it is, and sometimes we have to swallow our pride and do that. Here's what Solomon says in, ver in chapter 19. Get all the advice and instruction you can so that you will be wise the rest of your life. So this is something we shouldn't just uh, fall into, but something we should seek out actively. Maybe we're afraid of what we're learning. Maybe we're afraid that it will require us to change. There may be many reasons why we are resistant to good advice. But what Solomon is telling us is that the wise person is the one who wants to learn, who stays open, whose heart is willing to hear what others have to say. Henry Cloud is a wonderful psychologist, and I've appreciated his work. He's got a book called Integrity. And in the book Integrity, he's describing this concept as the willingness to engage with reality as it really is. How do you get yourself ready to deal with the real world as it really is rather than the world as I wish it were? So engaging with reality. And so he tells a story one day about a group of business leaders who got together and they were going to share with each other some of the things that they had learned. All the people in this group were senior, experienced leaders. They were, you know, 60 years old. Uh, they were at the top of their game. They had lots of life experience, except for one guy. There was one young leader in the group. He was only 35 years old. He was just younger. And 
Each of the leaders had a chance to tell a little bit about their situation and their story, and others, you know, listened uh, sympathetically. They were sharing together. After the young guy spoke, the 35-year-old, he shared some of the things that he was experiencing, some of the problems he was having, and so forth. And one of the older people said, are you open to some feedback? <laughs> now, that's an interesting question, right? What are you going to tell me? Do I have spinach in my teeth? Or what exactly is going to go on? I have no idea what he's going to say. It could be, like, hard. He might take me to the woodshed. So Henry Cloud says, observing this, I thought to myself, I wonder what this 35-year-old is going to say. Is he going to be open to this or not? The young man, listening to the older man, who said, are you open to some feedback? He responded by saying, absolutely. Give me a gift. Henry Cloud reflected, this guy's going to go a long way in life because he's paying attention to those who are wise, who have something to share. Give me a gift. So, what's the, so the question is, are you open to that kind of a gift? when somebody wants to share it with you. Now, feedback is good. Wisdom is helpful. But not all feedback is created equal. So Solomon has a second concept for us here. The second concept he wants to share is that we should open our hearts, but we should also be smart enough to test with good thinking and God's Word. When people give us advice, we should test that against God's Word. Now that's what makes this <coughs> series that we're in so significant and so fantastic, because when you learn the story of the Bible, you are learning the background that allows you to evaluate the wisdom that you hear. The story is going to point you to wisdom. And God's way so often corresponds with the rest of human wisdom. And so God's word and what we understand from the world that God has made, all of this fits together. And when we get a piece of wisdom, we need to use that to evaluate what we hear. So here's what Solomon says in Proverbs 14. The simple believe everything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. The simple-minded person believes just anything. They're gullible. But the prudent person, the one who is prudent, will give thought to their steps. Now, I want to just share that um, part of what's exciting about living in this day and age is that we are learning so much about God's Word, and it gives us a context and, a, and wisdom so that we can understand the word, world that we live in. So there's this whole study called apologetics. Now, this is not about apologizing. That's different. Apologetics is sort of giving a reason why we understand the Christian faith to be true. What is it that gives us confidence in God's Word? Well, it turns out that this is a field of study that really helps us as we gain wisdom and apply it to life. And I'd like to give you just one little taste test. This is like just a little hors d'oeuvre uh, in this whole area of study. I want you to think about our universe for a second. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 12, God called the guy named Abram, and he said, I'm going to make your descendants, your family, so numerous it will be like the stars of the sky or the, or the sands of the sea. Do you remember that comment in Genesis 12 where God calls Abram and eventually he, becomes his, he and his family become the nation of Israel? So let's pick up on this idea of the stars and the grains of sand. And I just want to ask you a question. Which number do you think is bigger? Do you think it's the stars in the universe or all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the earth? Which is the bigger number, do you think? Anybody think the stars, there's more stars than grains of sand? Okay. A few brave souls. But really, it's the grains of sand would be the larger number, right? Would you all agree with that? Everybody agreed and nod and say yes and amen. Amen. Good, good. Thank you. Great. I've, I've led you down the, the path to destruction because, in fact, 
the stars are, you're right, more numerous than the sand of grain, the grains of sand at every beach around the world. Now, wrap your mind around that for just a second. Doesn't that boggle you? Now, just back up one step. Think about the God who created that universe where there are more stars than all the grains of sand in the entire universe. Is that mind-boggling? How great is your God? I think we just sang that song, didn't we? <clears throat> now, here's the thing about that universe that God has created. That universe is designed for life. It had to be designed exactly perfectly, very, very precisely, in order for life to even exist. If God hadn't designed this universe exactly the way he designed it, you and I would not be having this conversation today because we wouldn't exist. In fact, the universe is so precisely designed that it tells us there must be an intelligence. There is an intelligence in our universe. Stephen Hawking, who is a well-known scientist, said that if the rate of the expansion of the world were different by just a little bit, life would not be possible. And here's the number. If it was different by one part in 100,000 million million, it would not be possible for us to have life. Isn't it amazing that the, the existence of the universe and the character of the universe points to the God of wisdom who uh, allows us to live in his truth? Fred Doyle, uh, Fred Hoyle, excuse me, a Nobel Prize winning astronomer, puts it this way. A common sense interpretation of the facts tells us that a super intellect has monkeyed with the laws of physics. It's like a super intellect had to design this thing. And guess what? We know who that is. The intelligence that designed this mind boggling universe is the intelligence who through the Holy Spirit and through the pen of Solomon gave us this wisdom that we're talking about this morning. Now I'd like to give a little uh, illustration here. This is not gonna be nearly as cool as uh, water and cooking oil in the same jar. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful illustration. But I like this an example because it helps us think of a way to apply this idea of wisdom to our lives. So are you ready to go with me on this? So I want you to imagine that this is a, a wonderful work of art here. And I'm not an artist, but um, let's just imagine that, you know, that this is a large frame. Okay. Whoops. All right. And uh, so you've got a frame, and then you've got a picture in the middle of the frame. Now, I want you to think about the things that happen in your life as the content of this picture, okay? So let's just imagine that the frame that's around your life, that gives shape and meaning for your life, um, is something that says, life stinks, It says, uh, no one cares. It says, no one knows who you are. You're out here on your own. Life stinks and then you die. Okay? There are people who believe that, who think that that's the truth. Now let me ask you, if that's the way you frame up your life, what happens when your physician says you have cancer? Do you see how this affects the meaning of this experience? But what if we change it? What if instead of saying that life stinks, what if we said that God loves? And what if in saying, uh, instead of saying no one cares, we say God cares? And instead of saying that no one knows, God knows. 
And what if we add that God is always at work in your life, both to know and to do His good pleasure, that He is at work in your life to bring what is good for your life. Now, if this diagnosis comes, does that affect your experience of that reality? This is an illustration of how perspective, how taking the big story of the Bible as the frame of meaning for my life makes a difference in how I experience all the ups and downs of life. And certainly my experience of not getting that first job, which I really thought I wanted, fits into this category, right? Because guess what? I didn't know, but who did? To fear God is to love Him, to respect Him, to honor Him, to live your life out of a sense of devotion to Him. I think you could agree that you're either going to fear God or you're going to fear others, human beings, society. In fact, maybe it could be said that we will all fear someone. Oswald Chambers says the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. But when you don't fear God, you fear everything else. There's a story by a guy named Dan Bowen. A generation ago, he went to Iran. He was captured by the police there and wrongfully accused of being a spy. An Iranian judge threw him into an infamous high-security prison in Iran. One day, it came, for him, it came time for him to face this judge in court. And he wrote later, Bauman wrote later about his experience. He said, As I took my place before the judge on the witness stand, he looked at me intently and said, Mr. Bauman, tell us why you have come to Iran. Could you imagine being in that spot? This judge had the ability, he says, to uh, order my execution. So, scared and intimidated by the fear of this man, I took a long pause The judge waited for my answer. The video cameras also waited. This judge had the power to order my execution right then and there. I knew that he might do just that if I honored truthfully, or if I answered truthfully. But I also knew that I had to tell the truth about why I had come to Iran. As I opened my mouth, the truth is that I struggled, I struggled to say what was true. I was much afraid, and then something stronger than fear rose up in me. The Spirit of God gave me the confidence and the courage. And I looked directly at the judge, and I said, I have come to Iran to tell people like you about the love of Jesus. God gave me strength, said Dan Bauman. The more I shared my faith, the bolder I became. And on that day in the Iranian courtroom, I realized that I was free. My fear of man had been overcome. The rest of the story is that somehow, through God's work, 63 day, days later, Bauman was released. Do you find yourself living in the wrong kind of fear, fear of human beings? Then listen to the wisest man who ever lived, because the best course of action is to learn from him, to test according to Scripture, to listen to others, and to live your life according to the wisdom that God offers. You can make a decision to shape your life by following Christ as your master. And this is something that we can do once and for all, and then we can follow up on a daily way. And the beautiful thing is that this church is full of people who will walk with you. So I encourage you, shape your life around the wisdom that we learn from God's Word, from the pen of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the truth of your Word and for the confirmation that we see in the natural world and for the reality that we can live in the light of this truth, lives that are full of hope and full of peace. Like Dan Bauman, give us the courage to live in your wisdom so that our lives are governed by the fear of the Lord and not the fear of human society. This we ask in the name of Christ. Amen.